reading in verse 1, and let's talk about awakening to Jesus' call. Acts 1 and verse 1. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. Those are important words right there. Until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving commandments through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke to them about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he said to them, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father has promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We're not going to take the time to read all the verses, but it says immediately after that, Jesus led the disciples to the Mount of Olives, where he ascended to the Father, to heaven. Two angels came and said to the disciples, they said, uh, why are you looking up in the sky? This same Jesus will come again. They went back to the upper room where they gathered together in constant prayer and they selected a replacement for Judas who had betrayed Jesus. We're going to talk about all of these things today and we're going to talk about answering God's call on our lives. Let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to be with us. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the people you love so much. Thank you for your presence here and your powerful word. I pray that you'd come, Holy Spirit, and awaken your church in Jesus' name. Amen. Beloved, I want you to receive the word of the Lord this morning. It's time to wake up. It's time to get up and shake off spiritual slumber. It's time to roll out of soft beds and off of soft couches. Rouse yourself. Arise. Jesus is calling. Awake, my beloved. Awake. We've been on a journey of discovery together since January of 2011, and it's been all about Jesus. We traveled through the Gospels together, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We talked about who is Jesus, witnesses to Jesus. We talked about the words of Jesus, the works of Jesus, the way of Jesus, the wounds of Jesus. We investigated one-on-one -on -one encounters with Jesus we talked about the word and the wind of God and we're all out of gospels and it's a good thing because I'm all out of W's. But today we begin a new leg of our journey into the book of Acts. And I want you to understand that it's still all about Jesus. The opening line of Acts tells us so. Dr. Luke says in my first book, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. This second book, the book of Acts, is the continuation of Jesus' ministry on earth. It's what Jesus is still doing and teaching through us, his church. You know, the title, The Acts of the Apostles, was given to this book in about the third century. And most theologians agree that, eh, you know, it's not quite a perfect fit. Because what this book really records are the acts of Jesus Christ through his church, empowered by the Holy Spirit. There's a word that's burning on my heart this morning from the Holy Spirit, and it's this. It's time for the church to awaken to Jesus' call on our lives. If you've received Jesus Christ as your Savior if you've invited him to be your Lord, the leader of your life, then Jesus has a claim on you. You are not your own. You've been bought with a price. Your life belongs to Jesus. Your body belongs to Jesus. Your days and your months and your years belong to Jesus. 
You are his workmanship, created in him, a new creation to do good works, which God ordained in advance for you to do. You know, those good works are not good deeds. As important as good deeds are, the good works that Paul is talking about there are the supernatural works of Jesus. Laying hands on the sick and seeing them recover in Jesus' name. Delivering those who are oppressed by demons in the name of Jesus and telling the good news about God everywhere. Paul says, you, Peter says, excuse me, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. You know, that word peculiar doesn't mean odd, as many odd people as we've met. But that word peculiar means claimed. You are a claimed people. God has a claim on you. Paul said, I pray that the eyes of your heart would be open so that you would understand what is the hope of his calling. Beloved, I want to tell you, your call is not your call. It's not your call whether you're called. You are called. It's not your call to what work God has called you. It's his call on your life. And here is the call. Jesus has called you to help finish what he began. There's a critically important message in the book of Acts. God's plan of salvation is not finished yet. You know, sometimes we forget that because we talk so much about the finished work of Calvary. And it's true. The cross of Jesus Christ was a once and for all sacrifice. Jesus' blood accomplished what the blood of bulls and goats never could. He paid in full the price for the sins of the world. No additional sacrifice is necessary. Indeed, no additional sacrifice is possible. It is finished. The old covenant is finished. The cross is finished. The resurrection is finished. The ascension of Jesus into heaven is finished. His elevation to a throne at the right hand of God is finished. But I want you to know that God's plan of salvation is not yet finished. The spread of the gospel to the ends of the earth is an integral part of God's plan of salvation. Beloved, listen to me. The fulfillment of the Great Commission is just as important to God's plan of salvation as was the cross. You see, the sufferings of Jesus are only beneficial for those who have heard the good news about them and have been given an opportunity to respond. How shall they be saved? unless they hear how shall they hear unless they're told how shall they be told unless someone goes and the second coming of jesus is an integral part of god's plan of salvation it's not complete until he reigns and puts all things under his feet and then comes again to receive his own and to judge the world in righteousness so i want you to understand this we live in a time when God's plan of salvation is still unfolding. It's still being carried out. It's not yet complete. While this old globe is still spinning, there's salvation work to be done, and Jesus has called you to help finish it. In Acts chapter 1, I find three acts in response to Jesus' call, and I want to share them with you quickly. Three acts in response to Jesus call the first one is this in response to his call live with your eye on the sky in response to his call live with your eye on the sky you know I love the account of Jesus ascension here in Acts chapter 1 Jesus leads the disciples to the top of the Mount of Olives and then he is enveloped in a cloud of Shekinah glory. It's the same glory that Peter and James and John saw on the Mount of Transfiguration. It's the same glory that appeared from time to time in the Old Testament. Jesus is enveloped in this glory cloud and he ascends out of sight. And the disciples are left standing there staring into the empty sky with their mouths open. Ever done that? I remember one time we were in Florida, very near Cape Canaveral, on a day when the space shuttle was launched. 
And we had a great view of the space shuttle as it rocketed towards heaven with this uh, big tail of fire behind it. And long after it had disappeared into the haze, we were so stunned by how spectacular it was, we just stood there staring into the sky. The disciples were standing there looking up and two angels sidled up next to them and said, what you looking at? And then they reiterated Jesus' promise. This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come again the same way you've seen him go. If I might paraphrase the message of the angels for you, what they're saying is, don't just stand there. Jesus is coming again. So they hurried back to Jerusalem to commence the work that Jesus had called them to do. That was their first act. Beloved, I want to say to you this morning, if it was urgent for the apostles to get busy in A.D. 33, how much more urgent do you suppose it is that we get busy in A.D. 2012? Jesus is coming again. Don't just stand there. The signs of his appearing are all around us. Pastor Nick shared several of them with us last week. Beloved, I want to tell you that I believe that the world stage is quickly being set for the climax of human history. If Jesus tarries any longer, it's only his sheer mercy in answer to our prayers on behalf of our lost loved ones. Don't just stand there. Jesus is coming again. The signs of his imminent return should light a fire under us to act, to move, to throw ourselves wholeheartedly into the work of Jesus. You'll have to remind me to thank our friend Patty Tate for getting us sucked into a new project at home. Pastor Ray and Patty are the founding pastors here at Harvest Time. And some of you know that Patty Tate is an interior decorator. And this summer she introduced us to something new called chalk paint. Chalk paint is a special kind of paint that you can apply to antique furniture with almost no preparation. And it dries with this really cool kind of matte finish to it. So Denise and I found an old bench in a junk store and we decided to try our hand at chalk painting. The other afternoon, the weather was a little sketchy, but I had a window of time just long enough to put a coat of paint on our bench, or so I thought. I might have had enough time if it weren't for the fact that I had a little helper. <laughs> Lolly decided that Chalk painting looked like fun and she wanted to help out, so I got her a brush and we started chalk painting calmly. And then Maddie noticed what we were doing and she thought it looked like fun and she wanted to get into the act, so I got another brush. And the next thing I knew, I was in the middle of a chalk paint fiasco. <laughs> Duck egg blue paint was going everywhere. Paint was running down the sides of the can. Paint was all over the tarp. Paint was all over the girls. Paint was all over me. The only thing that wasn't covered with paint was the bench. <laughs> and in fact, there were splatters and drops and drips that were hardening on the bench. And then all of a sudden, I heard a roll of thunder in the sky and a particular rustling in the leaves, and I felt a drop on my head. And all of a sudden, I started working with my eye on the sky. And you know, I forgot about everything else. I shut everything else out and I focused on one thing, finishing the job. And I got that bench painted and I got it dragged into the garage just literally as the heavens opened up and poured. Beloved, Jesus has called us to live our lives with our eye on the sky. The clouds are gathering. I want to tell you the heavens are about to open up. Jesus is about to come again in a cloud of glory. And it's time that we get focused on finishing the work that he began. This isn't a time to focus anymore on earthly pursuits or earthly comfort or security. It's a time to focus on doing the will of the Father and finishing his work. I wonder if we really understand what it meant for the disciples to go back to Jerusalem. 
You know, on that first Easter morning, when Jesus rose again, it must have been a relief to receive his instructions. Go to Galilee and I'll meet you there. Galilee was their home. Galilee was familiar and comfortable. Their boats and their nets were friendly old companions. Galilee was safe. It was far away from Jerusalem. They didn't have an accent in Galilee. They sounded like everyone else. The Sanhedrin wasn't hunting for them in Galilee. Luke records that over a period of 40 days after the resurrection, Jesus appeared to the disciples numerous times. There are actually 10 post-resurrection appearances of Jesus recorded in the New Testament, and it alludes to the fact that there are others that are not recorded. Paul says that on one occasion, Jesus appeared to more than 500 people at one time. Luke says that Jesus did this to give them many convincing proofs that he was indeed raised from the dead. You know, sometimes when you see something extraordinary just once, you even begin to doubt yourself. Are my eyes playing tricks on me? Did I really see what I thought I saw? But when you see something again and again, you're certain of what you saw. Jesus talked with them and he ate with them. He even made them breakfast. Luke also says that Jesus taught them. He explained the Old Testament scriptures in light of his cross and his resurrection. He taught them more about the kingdom of God. And Luke says that Jesus gave them commands through the Holy Spirit. The command that Jesus gave was the Great Commission. Go back to Jerusalem, wait for the promise of my Father, and you shall be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. I wonder if we really get it. I wonder if we really understand what Jesus was asking. See, Jesus was asking them to sacrifice a life of security. Galilee was safe. Jerusalem was not safe. It's clear from the following chapters in Acts that the death of Jesus did nothing to assuage the anger of the Sanhedrin. In fact, as the disciples insisted that Jesus was alive again, they became even further enraged. Galilee was safe. In Jerusalem, interrogation was awaiting them. Beatings were awaiting them. Imprisonment, even stoning to death, was awaiting them. Not only was Jesus asking them to sacrifice a life of security, he was asking them to sacrifice a life of comfort. They gave up family and friends, homes and businesses, everything that was familiar to them. Did it ever occur to you that once they got to Jerusalem, the road never led home again? They went on to Judea, and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. They went on to die as martyrs and to be buried in strange soil. Jesus was asking them to sacrifice their dreams of success. It's really quite remarkable in verse 6 that after the cross and resurrection and even after 40 days of further instruction about the kingdom, the disciples still didn't quite get it. They were still expecting an earthly messianic kingdom. They were still hoping to sit in seats of earthly power next to Jesus in Jerusalem. And Jesus asked them to lay down their dream of earthly power in exchange for another kind of power, the power of the Holy Spirit to be his witnesses. Go back to Jerusalem, wait for the promise of my Father, and then become my witnesses. You think it was easy to go back to the upper room? Jesus was asking them to abandon it all for the sake of his call, and they said yes. Beloved, everybody, look at me. 2,000 years later, Jesus is asking nothing less of you. Beloved, Jesus isn't just an accessory. He's not just a bauble. Jesus is not just a part of a, a well-rounded life. For those who belong to him, Jesus is the very substance of life. For me to live is Christ. Jesus is asking you today, will you abandon it all for the sake of 
Will you forgo the pursuit of success and comfort and security and allow your life to be overtaken by his call to a mission? Will you forgo your American dream and become consumed by his call to become his witness in the world? Go to Jerusalem, wait for the promise of my father and you shall be my witnesses. Beloved, I want you to know that we are living in radical times. And radical times demand believers who are radically sold out for Jesus and focused exclusively on finishing his work. Don't just stand there. Jesus is coming. Live with an eye on the sky. Three acts in response to Jesus' call. The second act I find is this. Hang tight with believers who think alike. Hang tight with believers who think alike. The second act that I find here in Acts chapter 1 is the ongoing gathering in the upper room. What a motley crew those first believers were. What a diverse group. They were different from one another in every way possible. They were socially diverse. They were economically diverse. They were politically diverse, theologically diverse. There were male and female gathered together, something highly unusual in Jesus' day. Before they met Jesus, some of them were establishment and some of them were radically anti-establishment. I would have loved to know how Matthew, the tax collector, got along with Simon, the anti-government zealot. Some had been with Jesus from the very beginning. And others were only recently believers in him. The 11 were there. And the women who supported Jesus. Mary, the mother of Jesus, was there. Not only did Mary give birth to Jesus, but she helped give birth to the church in the upper room. And the half-brothers of Jesus were there. John tells us that even within six months of the cross, Jesus' own brothers didn't believe he was the Messiah. But Paul records that the resurrected Christ appeared to James, the half-brother of Jesus. So at least some of Jesus' half-brothers were fairly new converts in the upper room. They came together, people from all different walks of life and all different experiences and backgrounds, but they came together united in their love for Jesus and their commitment to his call. And beloved, what the church was then, the church is still today. People gathered together from all different walks of life. Look around for one moment. Just look, you know, you're beautiful. You look good. Look around at each other. People from all different walks of life and backgrounds. But we've been gathered together from all different places around our country and even different countries from the world. God has gathered us together, united in our love for Jesus and our commitment to his call. Acts 1.14 says they all join together constantly. Two important points. They came together and they stayed together. Beloved, one of the important messages from the book of Acts is that Christians are meant to come together and they are meant to stay together. The Christian life is meant to be lived out within a community of believers. Jesus said so. Christians worship together. Christians pray together. Christians learn the word together. Christians serve together. Christians do life together. Christians submit to one another out of love and reverence for Christ. Christians persevere together. And when we do, that's when the light of the gospel shines most brightly through us. I have two words from the Holy Spirit this morning, and I hope since it's my birthday weekend, you'll give me a little attitude. I, I hope you'll give me just a, a little grace, a little permission. Two words from the Holy Spirit. The first word is, don't be a loose connection. And the second word is, don't be a lone ranger. I have a set of three matching lamps in my office. I bought them 100 years ago at the Bombay Company. Do you remember that story? And one of those three lamps has a loose connection. Sometimes it's on and sometimes it's off. Sometimes it's off and on and off and on and off and on. And every time I turn the switch, I never know what I'm going to get. 
You know, when it's working, it's great. But when it's not working, the light in my office isn't nearly as bright. And that's just like some believers. Their connection with the body of Christ, the local body of Christ, is too loose. Sometimes they're on, sometimes they're off. Sometimes they're on and off and on and off, and you never know what you're going to get. Beloved, I want to tell you, the Holy Spirit wants to speak to you today. God wants to firmly connect you to his local body. Would you let me meddle a little bit more this morning? Summer's over, so it's time to stop sunning yourself, and it's time to come to church on the first day of the week and worship the sun. See, Sunday is the Lord's day. Sunday is for worship. Sunday is for Christian fellowship. It's time to come home from your summer vacation from your church family and get plugged in. You know, we miss you when you're not here. And we're not as bright when you're not here. It's time to get reconnected, get plugged in on Tuesday nights for adults. I'm teaching Cleansing Stream uh, these, uh, and these Tuesdays in the fall at 7 o'clock. If you've never taken Cleansing Stream, it's one of the most powerful courses that we offer here at Harvest Time. We invite the Holy Spirit to come and to search us, to examine our heart, to test our thoughts, to examine our ways, to see if there's anything that's not pleasing to Him, to see if there's anything in our life that's withholding the flow of His blessing. We ask the Holy Spirit to expose it, and then we ask the Holy Spirit to remove it. Part of Cleansing Stream is a retreat that we take together. And I want to tell you that most people at Harvest Time that have been through it report that next to their salvation experience, it's one of the most powerful things that they've ever experienced in their walk with Christ. Get plugged in on Tuesday nights. If your family is with you, get plugged in on Wednesday evenings. Get plugged in young adults on Thursday nights. There's men's ministry. There's ladies ministry. Something happening every day of the week. Get reconnected to the the body come together with us in one purpose you know the word homothomidin it says they join together that's the word homothomidin it means to be of one mind you know that doesn't mean that we agree on everything does it mean that we agree on how things maybe should be done? The first believers certainly didn't. But it means that we have united around one common purpose. So, beloved, I'm asking you, rally with us around the goal of making Jesus Christ famous in Greenwich, Connecticut. Rally with us around the goal of making Jesus famous in Westchester County and Fairfield County and Putnam County and these northern suburbs of New York. Rally with us around the goal of proclaiming the good news about Jesus to the ends of the earth. Come on, that's good. Go ahead. Don't be a loose connection. And the other word I have from the Holy Spirit is don't be a lone ranger. Beloved, can I tell you, TBN is terrific. Daystar is dandy. CBN, Sky Angel, Inspiration. Thank God for all those resources. But I want you to know those things are nice supplements, but they're not substitutes for the local church. I love Joyce. I love her teaching. Listen, I used to listen to Joyce literally 20 years ago in Missouri when you didn't even know she existed on the East Coast. I've always liked Joyce. But I want to tell you, sitting in your living room watching television is no substitution for participation in a local body of believers. Kim Clement is cool, but prophetic ministry doesn't take the place of pastoral instruction in the word. And unfortunately, sometimes television ministries feed those who have an unhealthy, independent spirit. Beloved, can I tell you that many believers today have an unresolved issue when it comes to authority started in their life before they met Jesus and it's something they've never repented of after having come to Christ and they don't get along in the local body. They're unteachable, they're spiritually superior, and they don't know how to play nice in the sandbox. <laughs> they are spiritual lone rangers. Do you know what happens to lone rangers? 
eventually they find themselves alone, surrounded by the enemy. Do you know how the Lone Ranger met his end? The Lone Ranger and Tonto were camped out in a small valley hiding from the Indians. So the Lone Ranger sent Tonto up to the crest of the hill on one side of the valley to look out and see what was the situation. And Tonto came back with bad news. He said, Kimosabi, Apache are coming from the north. So the Lone Ranger sent him up to the brow of the hill on the opposite side to see if the coast was clear. And he came back with more bad news. Kimosabi, Apache are approaching from the south. He sent him to the other side, the east side, the west side. Each time he came back with terrible news. Kimosabi, the Apache are approaching from every direction. The Lone Ranger looked at Tonto and he said, Tonto, we're in serious trouble. And Tonto looked back at him and said, What mean we, white man? <laughs> Beloved, if you're a Lone Ranger, one day you're going to find yourself all alone, surrounded by the enemy. Don't be a Lone Ranger and don't be a loose connection. Come together with a community of believers and stick together with them. They all join together constantly. Hang tight with believers who think alike. Three acts I find in response to Jesus' call. The final act is this. Keep going on no matter what has gone on. Keep going on no matter what has gone on. The first act of the believers was to return to Jerusalem. The second act was to gather together and to stay together. The third act, I find, was that they replaced Judas so that the apostolic ministry could go on. Beloved, keep going on no matter what has gone wrong. Keep going on no matter who is gone. Yesterday was my 46th birthday. I've been walking with Jesus for 38 years. I can't wait till I'm 48 and then I can stand up and testify like the little old ladies in Maine used to do. I've been serving the Lord for 40 years and he's never failed me yet. And I can tell you in 38 years the Lord has never failed me. But I can tell you something else. Not everyone will finish this journey with you, but keep going anyway. I got saved when I was eight years old in the suburbs of Philadelphia during a wonderful outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I want to tell you what we've tasted at the Greenwich outpouring is just a glimpse of the things we experienced in those days. We saw dramatic healings. We saw hundreds and hundreds of people come to faith in Jesus Christ. And actually, a lot of the people that we started out with are still following Jesus today. But so many others who tasted the goodness of the Lord with us have fallen away, and it's painful. I understand the sting in Peter's voice here. When he says Judas was one of us, he shared in this ministry, and he led them to come and arrest our Savior and our Lord. And yet behind the decision to fill his apostolic office was the resolve to keep going on. Beloved, keep going on. No matter what has gone wrong, no matter who is gone, no matter what's gone on, keep going on. Keep going on, though some have fallen asleep. You know, most of my fathers and mothers in the Lord are home with Jesus now. They've fallen asleep in Christ. My old beloved pastor who led me to Jesus and who mentored me in ministry. Our Bible school teachers, they're all gone. The leaders of the early charismatic movement, they've all gone home to be with Jesus now. But there's still work to be done and so we go on. Maybe someone precious and dear to you started out this journey with you and maybe they've gone home to be with Jesus. Maybe they've fallen asleep in Christ. Beloved, can I tell you, there's still work to be done and so we go on. Keep going on, though some have fallen away from the faith. I don't really know what happens in the heart of a man that would cause him to ever turn his back on Jesus. But Jesus said it would happen. 
He said that demonic influence would steal the seed of salvation away from some. That the trials of life and especially persecution will cause others to spiritually wither. Did you hear the good news that Pastor Yusuf Nadarkani in Iran was freed yesterday after three years of imprisonment? If a man could spend three years in prison for the right to worship Jesus in his own country, isn't the least that we could do is come together to worship him? Jesus said wealth and the cares of the world would choke out faith in others. Paul wrote to Timothy, Demas has forsaken me having loved this present world. Beloved, not everyone that will start the journey with you will finish with you. Some won't make it. Some will give up. Some will turn back. But you keep going anyway. Keep going on even though your leaders have made mistakes. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, Judas wasn't the only one who did Jesus wrong. Peter had his own very public failure. The one who had so boldly announced to Jesus just hours earlier, Lord, I'll follow you even into death, was now undone by a little teenage girl who challenged his faith. Who is Peter now to presume to lead them in the selection of Judas' successor? Given his failure, he should have sat down in the back of the room and stayed quiet. John had been the bravest out of all of them. He should have led the meeting. But they recognized the Holy Spirit's mantle of leadership resting on Peter, and they made the decision to keep on going in spite of the mistakes that he had made. Beloved, can I tell you that human leaders in the body of Christ will make mistakes? The church in the book of Acts is a healthy church, but it is not a perfect church. It's a church in which there were conflicts and disagreements and even sharp fights between national leaders. But the grace of God was with them to keep going on. I make mistakes. I know you don't think I do, but I make mistakes. Other pastors make mistakes. Denominational leaders make mistakes national ministers make mistakes but keep going on anyway beloved look at me i know that some of you have genuinely been hurt by people representing the ministry and i'm so sorry for that but look at me never 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 withhold worship from a good god just because a flawed man hurts you Paul said, God has hidden his treasure, treasure in earthen vessels. You know what I call that? Cracked pots. That's what we are. Cracked pots, all of us, carrying the glory of God inside so that everyone will know that the all-surpassing glory comes from him. Keep going on even though some have had catastrophic failures. It says here in Acts chapter 1, everyone in Jerusalem knew about Judas's disgrace. Everyone in Jerusalem knew that Judas had betrayed his Lord. It was a terrible black eye for Jesus and for his followers, but they decided to keep going on. Sometimes ministers fall and it makes national headlines and it gives a terrible name to all followers of Jesus. But we keep going on anyway. You know, I went to Bible school in the late 1980s when the two most prominent ministers in our denomination had colossal moral failures. Jim Baker followed by Jimmy Swagger. Those were not happy days to be in the assemblies of God. Since I was a Bible college student, people used to ask me where I work. What denomination do you belong to? Uh, the assemblies of God. <laughs> but we keep going on. Beloved, I pray that the Holy Spirit will come right now. And I pray that he will reawaken your sense of calling. Pastor Nick, come help me. You are not your own. 
You are bought with a price. You are a peculiar person. You're a claimed person. May you know the hope of his calling that's resting on your life. God's plan of salvation is not yet complete. Jesus has called you to finish what Jesus began to do and teach. Will you respond to his call? Will you live with your eye on the sky? Will you hang tight with believers who think alike? Will you keep going on no matter what has gone on? Beloved, if it be true that we are the last generation of the church before Jesus comes back, then let's make sure that we finish this well. Let's finish well what Jesus started. Let's finish well what Peter and James and John and the 120 in the upper room started. Let's finish well what Paul and his companions started. Let's finish well what the church fathers and the saints of God have labored for down through the centuries. Let's finish well what the martyrs have spilled their blood for. Let's finish well what lovers of God in every generation have sacrificed so much for. And let's make sure that our sacrifice is no less than theirs. Let's finish well what Pastor Tate and a handful of believers started here in 1983. God sent a man to Greenwich with a promise that there was a harvest here and we have yet to realize the full extent of the harvest that God has ordained for harvest time. Let's pray, let's work, let's serve, let's sacrifice, let's give, let's follow the leading of the Holy Spirit and finish well what they started. Let's finish well what we started together in 1999 when we purchased this land and we started this building. Our work here is not yet complete. Let's finish together. Let's rally and sacrifice and pray. Let's finish phase two, the largest auditorium in Tony, Greenwich, Connecticut, to the glory of God. Jesus has called you to finish his work would you say yes to him in Jesus name come on I want you to stand on your feet and I want you to give a great big praise I want you to give a great big glory and honor to Jesus Christ the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords come on I know you can do better than that come on I know we can do better let's give Jesus praise and glory and honor in this place we love you Jesus we love you, Lord Jesus. Come on, let's lift up our voices. Let's sing that wonderful name of Jesus. A big praise in this place. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. 
Will you lift up your hands? Come on, lift up your hands and just love on Jesus. Come on, just love on Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We worship you. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, awaken your church. Come, Holy Spirit, awaken your church. Come, Holy Spirit, awaken me. Come on, make that your prayer. Come, Holy Spirit, awaken me. Awaken me. Awake, awake, awake one that sleeps, and Christ will give you light. Awake, awake. Holy Spirit, awaken your church. Holy Spirit, awaken your bride. Awaken your church. Awaken me, awaken us. Oh God. Jesus, come awaken us. Awaken the call. Awaken the call. God, let the shackles of spiritual slumber fall off of us. Let us awake. Let us awake. Come on, would you lift your eyes to heaven right now? Lift your eyes to heaven. God, Father, would you help us to live with our eye on the sky? Father, would the promise and the signs of Jesus' imminent return light a fire under us to become consumed with the call of God? Father, I pray that you'd give us grace to lay aside, Lord, the pursuit of earthly pleasure and comfort and success. Lord, all the things the world has to offer. Father, I pray that we'd push them aside, Lord, and abandon it all for the sake of your call. God, I pray that an urgency from the Holy Spirit, Lord, would, would ignite within us to do the will of the Father and to finish his work before the heavens open up. Father, I pray that you'd help us to live with our eye on the sky. Come on, I want you to take the hand of someone. Take the hand of another believer. Everybody take somebody's hand. Everybody take somebody's hand. Father, in Jesus' name, God, would you help us to hang together, to hang tight with believers that think alike. God, I pray you'd help us to come in one mind, in homothomadin, Lord, rallying around one purpose, to make Jesus Christ famous. I pray, God, that there would be no loose connections, and I pray that there would be no lone rangers. God, I pray that we'd come together and stick together. God, I pray that we'd worship and pray that we'd learn your word, that we'd serve and do life together. I pray that we would submit to one another out of love for Jesus and reverence for Christ. Pray that we'd prevail together, persevere together. God, that we'd hang tight with one another so that our light can shine brightly in your world. And now, Father, I pray that you'd give us grace to keep going on no matter what's gone on, no matter what's gone wrong, no matter who's gone, God, I pray you'd give us grace to keep going on. God, in spite of those that have fallen asleep or fallen away, God, in spite of the failures of leaders and even catastrophic failures, God, I pray that you'd give us the perseverance God, to keep going on. I pray that you'd come by the Holy Spirit and strengthen us in our innermost being with the strength that comes from the Holy Spirit so that we would be firmly rooted and established and that we would grasp together with all the saints how high, high and how wide and how deep and how long is the love of God and to know that love that surpasses knowledge. God, I pray that you'd steal our will. Pray that you'd strengthen our spines. Give us backbones, Lord. And God, determination, Father, to keep going on. Lord, we say yes to your call. We say yes to your call. We say yes to your call. Father, I pray for America. God, thank you that you've blessed us to live in the greatest country ever, Lord, in human history. God, thank you, Lord, for this great privilege. And God, we pray that you'd help our country. We pray that you'd have mercy on America, oh God. We pray that you'd come, Lord, yet one more time. Lord, with a wave of awakening and revival. Lord, that would sweep this country away.